Hi, welcome to part two of Feeder Fishing on Rivers. First thing I want to talk to you about is swim selection and also, wow, there's a fish. Look at that. It feels like a decent barbel. Didn't let me finish what I was saying. What I wanted to say was, this is a pretty classic peg really because the flow comes from upstream where you've got some shallows we're on the inside of a sweeping bend, so the flow moves over from the middle over right over to the far bank and it's quite clear to see where the fish are going to be. And that's right under the trees over on the far bank. In fact, now the sun's come out, I'm having to cast right next to the tree. Now obviously the distance that you fish is going to be dictated to by having any cover, so you want to fish to the cover and also the conditions. If you're fishing in a flood or in high water conditions, you're not going to be able to fish effectively much past the middle of the river. Let's have a look and see what this fish is. Still not sure what it is. So when the river is in flood, I tend to concentrate on fishing a spot that I can fish effectively without snagging up or getting hassled by leaves and debris. And normally that's a third to halfway out. But when the river's lower like this, it's when the key factor is features. There we go, that's a nice barbel. It's only four or five pound, but it fought really well. And I took him on a boilie, on the pellet waggler, rather, pellet feeder setup. What a beautiful fish. Now, another situation that we might be faced is when the river's a bit more in flood, maybe three or four foot or even higher. I think in those conditions you can pretty much forget fishing over to snags. And the fish are going to move anyway. They're going to look for the slack water or the slower water. And I'll be looking to fish on the crease between the inside where it's slower and then starts to just pick up. So that could be a third out to a middle. Another factor to think about when the conditions are such when it's flooded and higher water is that when, that's when the 14 foot rod really comes into its own because that extra length helps to keep the line off the water to reduce the pressure on the line so you don't have to fish such a heavy feeder or lead and also it keeps the line clear of any debris that's coming down the river during flood conditions. So the two approaches that we're using today maggot feeder and ground bait feeder are really quite different and I guess we've learned a lot from specimen anglers in relation to using pellets and boilies and this more modern approach. For me, the maggot feeder still reigns supreme when the river's low and clear. But when there's floodwater conditions or colour in the river, the pellet is pretty much unbeatable nowadays. Obviously there's some crossover and fishing's fishing so it doesn't always play it by the textbook. But on a day like this when there's a foot on, a bit of colour, I will actually set both approaches up. And as it's proving, I'm getting bites on both. Now, a few other good tips to think about, and one of the biggest tips I was ever given when I started feeder fishing on rivers was think, float, and fish feeder. So the frequency of the casting is similar to that of when you're fishing a float. Don't just chuck the feeder out and wait for five or 10 minutes. Give it a couple of minutes and reel in. Be active, like when you're float fishing. It's gotta be the same situation of bait, being introduced into the peg, very frequently gets the fish into a, a good feeding frenzy and enables you to catch the fish. I think that's one of the most important points to think about. Also, think about the zone that you're casting. You'll often find that if you keep casting in one spot in quite a concentrated area, which is actually what you want to do to draw the fish into your peg, the fish sometimes back off. So if you've caught a few fish and it goes quiet, then you want to think about casting maybe a little bit further downstream or in even some cases, a little bit upstream. So fish have just maybe shied away from the main catching zone. One thing that I haven't mentioned in relation to how I'm fishing with these semi-bolt rigs is that I always like to cast straight in front of me or slightly upstream if the peg allows it. So if I've got a feature straight in front of me, then I'll fish slightly upstream of it so the feeder lands in front of it and I can let out a bow of line downstream. Now, I do that for two reasons. The first reason is, 
that you can actually use a lighter feeder if you put a bow in the line. If you tighten right up to it, you've got to sometimes use a very heavy feeder. And that's going to maybe inhibit the fishing a little bit if it's causing a great disturbance when a big feeder is hitting the water. But using a little feeder or a lighter feeder on a bow also means that the hook ability factor of the rig is increased significantly. The fish only has to pick up the bait, dislodge the feeder, you get a fantastic drop back bite and the fish is on. So I'd say for 80 to 90 percent of the time the bites you get are a classic drop back bite. The fish has hooked itself and all you've got to do is just gradually wind into it and play the fish. Obviously there's times when the rod doubles over and there's times when you get a tentative bite and there's a fish on. But it's quite a simple method, but it does take some time to balance the feeder correctly to the flow. And you need to vary the amount of line you let out for the bow. And obviously, with the add-on leads and different feeders, vary the weight of the feeder. Another good tip and consideration is the length of the hook length when you're fishing. When the fish are really feeding well, uh, and the, the fish are concentrated on the feeder, you want to use a short hook length means that you'll hit more bites and increase the effectiveness of the rig. However, when the fish back off or when the river's lower and clearer, you want to in increase the length of the hook length to maybe three, four, five foot to catch those sneaky fish that are hanging off the feed and also watching the feed as it comes down. And I also mentioned the tip in relation to changing the hook bait when we talked about baits. Don't just stick with one bait, even with maggots, if I'm fishing with two or three maggots, I'll try a double maggot, four maggots on a bigger hook. Might even put a lobworm or a piece of meat out on the maggot feeder, just as a change bait. It's amazing how many times you catch a fish out of the blue. Same story with the ground bait feeder. Vary the amount of feed that you're putting in through the feeder. So mix in more pellets if you're really catching, or if it goes harder, reduce the amount of pellets that you're feeding in the mix. And also change the hook bait. So try a boily or half a boily or a small pellet or a big pellet or two pellets. Really vary the bait that you're fishing with because even on a prolific river like this, you'll find that you have periods in the match or in the day when you're just not getting any bites. That's the time when you've really got to make it happen. So I'm having a fantastic time here. I hope those tips have helped you. I'm desperate to have another cast. So I'm going to cast in and I'm going to change from a boilie to two small pellets, just see if that makes any difference. That just shows exactly what I was talking about. I went for a phase of maybe half an hour, 40 minutes without a bite. So I changed to a block end feeder, filled it with pellets, with uh, two small pellets on the, on the hair, and I've hooked maybe the best fish of the day, a decent barbel. Just goes to show what reliable and balanced tackle can achieve combined with simple tactics and a wonderful river. What a great way to end the video. A lovely wide barbel, around about three or four pound. That concludes the video. If you've got any questions relating to the tactics at all, please don't hesitate to drop me an email at the website. And also, if you've got any queries relating to the products that I've talked about, we've got detailed explanations of all the gear on the Shakespeare website.